Saskia, um, who is the author of this book, um, A Spy in Canaan, How the FBI uh, Used a Famous Photographer to Infiltrate the Civil Rights Movement, is a longtime journalist. Uh, he worked for the Commercial Appeal, the Memphis newspaper, for 29 years. Um, he recently uh, became director uh, for the Institute of Public Service Reporting at the University of Memphis, which is a new institute there, and so really excited about the work that you'll be doing with that. His career, he's done lots of investigations on public corruption, um, but, but this uh, book was a uh, culmination of an investigation he did um, uh, from a tip that he received um, that a famous photographer, beloved photographer in the civil rights movement and in Memphis who shot hundreds, really, really literally thousands of photographs, important photographs of the civil rights movement, um, doubled as a paid FBI informant. Um, the newspaper broke that story. Um, they uh, spent a lot of money in a lawsuit to get the records from the FBI to confirm it and to, um, and to show that. And so this book really is a wonderful step back um, about how they got the story, but also um, what's, what some of it showed, including when he revisited with um, people who had been informed upon and shared with them the news. So he has a really great story to tell. We also have uh, Mandy Floyd here. She is, the staff, she is a staff attorney with the ACLU of Tennessee. And she's going to bring all this back to the present for us because there is a current political surveillance uh, case in Memphis that the ACLU is a, um, a party to. And she's going to explain that case. Uh, Mandy uh, graduated from Vanderbilt and uh, got her law degree at the University of Memphis at the law school there at the Cecil Humphrey School of Law. So um, we'll be, I think you'll be really interested in what she has to say. Uh, about the current case, and you'll see some some ties, and I'll let them go all into it. But we'll start with uh, Mark, and he's going to give his presentation, and then we'll go from there. Thank you, Mark. Ernest Withers was probably one of the most uh, important photographers of the 20th century. Um, probably many people have not heard of him, but he was famous in limited circles in his lifetime, uh, certainly within the movement. He was, he was a movement insider. He was well known in Memphis. Uh, he was uh, at one time a police officer in Memphis, one of the first African American police officers. He was also, he ran a very popular photography studio down on Beale Street. He uh, shot uh, freelance news photos for the Tri-State Defender, which was a satellite operation of the Chicago Defender. Um, and for Jet Magazine and numbers of publications across the country. Um, what, what, papers that back in those days were known as the black press, um, they didn't have wire service and he, he basically Ernest would hustle a living any way he could and, and he had eight children to feed, had a big family and um, but you know when his, his involvement in the news business really took his career off, it, it, it paralleled the rise of the civil rights movement and um, he covered the movement from its dawn in 1955 with the murder of Emmett Till all the way through to uh, the assassination of Dr. King in 1968 and beyond. And so, I mean, he was known as, as the eyes and ears of the movement. He shot some of the most poignant and um, powerful pictures of the movement. And some of them you would recognize without even knowing him. Um, he shot a very powerful picture at Emmett Till's trial. Um, <clears throat> when the judge had forbid any photography during the um, court session, but Ernest disobeyed that uh, the judge and, and shot this picture of Emmett Till's great uncle Moses Wright on the witness stand when he was asked to identify the defendants, the killers who had come into his house earlier that summer and abducted Emmett Till. And you know Emmett Till was never seen again. He stands up and points a finger at them. And it's at that moment that Ernest, from he's on the side of the courtroom, shoots this powerful picture. I mean, and you can Google this thing. You ought to check it out. He actually never got credit for that. Uh, a lot of his work, he would just sell on the spot. Um, he shot a pic. Uh, he covered the Montgomery bus boycott. He covered, um, you know, Dr. King. He shot this great power, another powerful picture of Dr. King riding one of the first integrated buses in Montgomery. Um, he covered the. Little Rock School Crisis in 1957, the integration of Ole Miss in 62, the assassination of Medgar Evers in 63, just on and on and on through the Memphis sanitation tr strike in 68 and beyond. One of the things that people didn't know and what my work uncovered was that um, 
while he was doing this, known as the eyes and ears of the movement, he was also doubling as, a, as an informant, a paid informant for the FBI. Um, he did this over the course of 18 years from 1958 until uh, 1976. This was a part of his life that was not known. It, it start, I first found out about it from, a, from a, um, an FBI agent, a retired agent, when I was covering hearings for James Earl Ray back in 1997 and 98 about, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, Ray was trying to get out of prison. He was dying of liver disease and there was a, it, stories all over the country being written about this. And um, I had a lot of latitude and was interviewing former police officers and military intelligence and FBI agents about the, about the assassination of Dr. King, which, you know, 30 years after the fact was back in the news. And there, this retired agent, this is when I first found out about Ernest Withers. Um, he, you know, this agent told me that he had been uh, a prolific informant for years. He helped them basically index the movement. Um, uh, this would come out over a period of time. Um, I never really got into the story then, back in that time, because you know the agent said he would deny it. But there's a whole series of events that we really don't have time to get into. But through a through a series of Freedom of Information Act requests, was able to find out you know the depth of what he was doing and, and how he was doing it. Um, we actually sued the FBI at one point and won a, a suit with, against them. But um, essentially, Ernest was valuable to the FBI in many ways because. Being a movement insider and being a man who knew everybody in Memphis, he could connect the dots for them. And this is, you know, the, the thing is about what the FBI was up to at that time, they, um, you know, all of this started in the, <clears throat> the, the intensive investigations that were going on was uh, a product of the Cold War at that time, um, you know, an ideological war with the Soviet Union. They had stolen our atomic secrets. You know, we'd gotten into war uh, with them in Korea. And um, the, the fear of communism became a very palpable thing here in America. Many, many Americans fe feared, you know, the communists were at our, at our throats, really. They had infiltrated our institutions. The level of paranoia got really big. This is what you know if you've read about the McCarthy era, era and whatnot. Um, you know, you'll find that it motivated and the government to really dig and treat many American citizens as if they were Foreign, foreign agents. Um, this is what the whole McCarthy era was about. In Memphis, the head of the operations there for domestic intelligence was a man named uh, William Lawrence. He basically ran their domestic intelligence operations over the course of a quarter of a century, from the late 40s on through to the early uh, 1970 when he retired. They eviscerated the Communist Party there in Memphis. The small contingent of Communist Party members that were there, they were, they were quite um, friendly with the civil rights movement. In fact, they were probably the best uh, friends of the civil rights that the civil rights movement at that time had. But they were either driven out of Memphis, um, or you know, many of them lost their jobs, and the remaining ones went underground. So, you know, when the '60s came around, there was nothing left for the Communist Party. But you started seeing all this unrest bubbling up, and this is where. Um, a lot of the FBI's attention moved to the movement. You know, all of this unrest. You had the Freedom Riders in '61. You had the sit-in movement here in Nashville to uh, to integrate public accommodations. A lot of this scared many Americans, and uh, it, uh, of course, in Ho J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, in his view, this, of course, was a very com they, the, he viewed it as a communist-influenced, if not controlled, movement. And a lot of this, these things that you've heard, you know, with Dr. King, the investigation of him basically started out as an investigation of, you know, whatever communist influence were on him, and it, uh, it morphed into, that, that's the thing about a lot of these investigations, there's a pretext of legitimacy, um, you know, the Cold War, you know, what, what, what influence did the communists have on, on our institutions and our leading dissidents here? I mean, it started as a legitimate investigation and morphed into something very in insidious and, and, and dangerous. If you're familiar with that story, I mean, they basically tried to destroy Dr. King politically. They, it became an investigation of his personal life, and they tried to leak many things about his personal life to the media. Um, as you see the arc of the 60s go on, you know, a lot of these investigations became just like that. I mean, the, 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 uh, the mid-60s, when he started having a lot of the urban unrest, it really gave the, uh, 
the government reason to look into a lot of these more militant wings of the civil rights movement. And, but oftentimes, now this is the danger that you'll see, is that these investigations, uh, the, the pretextually, you know, it was to prevent violence, it was to, it was to root out subversives, to root out communists, uh, but they oftentimes became very, very dangerous and morphed into other things altogether. This was one of the original documents that I got that I first was able to, to uh, identify Ernest, that my source, what he told me years earlier was correct, uh, that put me down that trail. Uh, it was basically a background report of an investigation of Ernest after the civil rights period waned in which he became, got involved in some uh, corruption and uh, became a target of an investigation. But this background report referred, it referred to er that Ernest Columbus Withers was formally designated as ME338R. And of course, at that time, I, I didn't know a whole lot, but I recognized that as an informant number, as a unique uh, identifier. The uh, ME stands for Memphis. The 338 is his sequential number. It's a unique number to him. Um, and so I was able to, they made, they were supposed to redact that, but they made that mistake over and over and over again in other documents. And that's what started this whole chain where I was able to, to uh, figure out specific things that he did for the FBI. But he started with them in, in 1958, and he got deep in 61. And then as the, as the unrest bubbled up in the mid to late 60s and the Black Power Movement took root in Memphis, they really, this is where he really, they really began investigating real deep. And Ernest got a lot more work out of that. This actually is from 1961, this slide here. But this, is, this was one of the first pictures of, uh, that the, I, I believe that's the very first photo of James Foreman and what became a massive file on him. If you're familiar with James Foreman, I mean, he was, he's considered an icon, a pillar of the movement. Um, in the early, the late 50s to the early 60s, the FBI was still trying to figure out who he was. He basically was a Chicago school teacher who kept showing up at civil rights skirmishes. And Ernest, early on, helped him figure out, because of his connections, who he was. And he was, this is a picture that he took of Mr. Foreman in uh, Tent City, it uh, was a, a community of uh, sharecroppers who had been kicked off their land for uh, registering to vote. And um, he, Foreman was basically being investigated as a communist. And um, you know, Ernest was valuable to the FBI as far as identifying him. As the movement went on, as the 60s went on, and the uh, peace movement flowered in Memphis as well, and, and Ernest was very good at helping the FBI identify these individuals too. One of the things that they were trying to do, they were cataloging the movement. They wanted to know who was who, A to Z. Um, some of these people they would go after, you know, to try to neutralize them. Uh, in this march here in 1966, they sent Ernest out. The, when you read the report, it says that he um, that he can go out under the pretext of a newsman because he has press credentials from the Tri-State Defender and Jet Magazine, and so they sent him out. He's taking what a lot of people thought were news pictures, but he had specific instructions to get identification photos, full, you know, full, good, clear facial shots is what they wanted. And after the march, he came back with about 80 8 by 12 photos. With, you know, and he was able to, of course, get, you know, as he always did, the names, the home addresses, um, you know, occupations many times. And he knew so many of these people, too, that he could you know, tell them who their relatives were. They would record all this as they built these dossiers. That's James Bevel. He, was, uh, he went to school here in Nashville many years ago. He's deceased now. He was uh, uh, a leader in the sit-in movements and the Freedom Rider movements. He also became uh, a member of uh, Dr. King's executive staff. When he came to Memphis, this, uh, this was 1968, a couple of weeks before Dr. King was shot there, um, Bevel, you know, was considered a, a, an extreme militant, uh, investigated as a communist. He, he was a big influencing factor on Dr. King coming out against the war, which made him all the more suspect. And so this particular picture that Ernest took of him was at Lemoyne College, which is an African-American school, all black. You know, the, all, the FBI at that time in Memphis was all white. They had no way to cover this unless they had, you know, someone like Ernest who his access was incredible. I mean, he could go in and out of anywhere, and so, and he he would you know deliver photos and oral intelligence. You know, they would they would they would debrief him constantly, and you know, sometimes it would be like once a month when times were slow, but when things were hopping, like during the sanitation strike, it would be every day. They'd be debriefing him and giving him oral intel, pictures, updates, strategies. He told them about this virulent Black Power speech that Bevel gave that day, which was helpful to the FBI in trying to 
trying to track this and also in their uh, campaign against Dr. King at that point they were trying to uh, paint him basically as someone who was too extreme, um, who was too sympathetic with the black power movement and he was planning this poor people's campaign at that time and they were very much opposed to him coming to Washington uh, and so th this was all helpful to them in assembling this information and trying to say that Dr. King has lost control of his movement. It's too, it's become violent, radical, militant and um, so these types of details were, were quite valuable to the FBI. I'm trying to get into some of the First Amendment abuses because this is one of the big questions that people have is, you know, what, what impact did these investigations really have? And they impacted our democracy in many ways. Again, you know, there's the, the pretext, the violence, the subversion. You know, there was some legitimate fear of, you know, with the rioting in the, in the mid to late 60s, but so many times the, these dangers were exaggerated. One of the big First Amendment abuses of these investigations was the chilling effect that it had. The church committee, that uh, congressional committee that reviewed some of these invest, uh, the, reviewed the FBI's work from the 60s, they, they, they were investigating this in the mid-70s and what, that's one of the findings that they had was that people knew that they were being watched they knew that they were building files on them, but they didn't know where they were getting the information from. They didn't know who the informants were. And so many people would just simply disassociate with the democratic movement. And that's the thing, too, is that so many of these activists were simply exercising First Amendment rights. They were you know, law-abiding, you know, exercising the right of free speech, dissent against government policy, but yet they were you know, being treated, essentially, as if they were enemies. And this building of the files, you know, that could keep them, you know, information that could keep them from getting government jobs or jobs in general. In, in Memphis, they had something called the interview program. When they got these information from informants, a lot of these activists, and particularly their recruits, they would go knocking on doors and they would knock on their parents' doors and their neighbors' doors and tell them, "Hey, you know, this guy is affiliating with communists." And he's uh, um, a lot of times they would tell them, "You know, these guys are going to be indicted and that sort of thing." A lot of scare tactics. So the chilling effect was a big thing, uh, but there were there were many other. Uh, ways that the government at that time was uh, chilling individuals and undermining them. A lot of the, the files, and there are scores and scores of these files, I've counted like 1,400 different independent photos or you know, reports that Ernest Withers helped contribute to. Um, one of the things he did was he, like, he gave them a lot of auto tag information. The FBI was working very close with the Memphis Police Department at, at that time, and a lot of this information they would pass to the Memphis Police Department, they would in turn like launder this money sometimes to do drug arrests or with the auto tags to uh, you know to basically ding people for not having proper registration. He gave them a lot of phone numbers. When they got phone numbers, they would uh, the FBI would basically do uh, warrantless searches of toll charges with the through the phone company to try to figure out who they're who they're talking to, who they're connected to. Sometimes when they got information on some of these young activists, they would, they would go to the draft board. There was a couple of reports in there about uh, one of the black power advocates, Charles Cabbage. Uh, Ernest Withers had found out about that he had, was losing his, uh, his uh, student deferment because he was no longer in school and he had been at Morehouse in Atlanta and he was from Memphis and was trying to get back in school but didn't really think he could get in, at that time get into Memphis State. and so. The FBI, Bill Lawrence, took this information to the draft board and made sure that he got drafted. This picture right here is from 1965, and there was a group in West, in West Tennessee that was, had come down to assist some of these um, sharecroppers in the tent city operations that had been kicked off their land. Students from Cornell University, and they were, were called the West Tennessee Voters Project. They were investigated intensely, um, looking for what they called subversive references, communist ties, Sometimes these investigations, they'd go back and look at the parents and the grandparents and, and on and on. It was very intense. But some of the things they were doing is they were looking at, you know, a lot of picky even things, you know, like relationships, interracial relationships. And these things went on. These people were young college students and they were, you know, experimenting. And, um, but a lot of the stuff wound up in FBI files. This, is, this picture here is a picture that Ernest took in his photography studio in 1965. I tried to redact the, the woman's identity because she is still alive and uh, the, the young man has passed on but I interviewed him before he died and basically said that Ernest asked him to come down there to his studio 
Um, the FBI was, you know, getting a lot of these relationships in their reports. And you wonder, well, why are they doing this? And um, it basically it gave them leverage. They were, they were operating like a big vacuum cleaner. They're, that's what was the, the way they approached it. In the reports they talk about this, they were sucking up all this information on this activist because they wanted to contain them. And so information like this gave them leverage. Now, it's hard to know whether they actually used this, but um, a picture like this in 1965, it doesn't look like anything now, but I mean, in, in the rural South, I mean, that, that was a potential death sentence right there. So, I mean, there were a lot of ways that, that the FBI tried, considered, or actually did undermine individuals. Another good example of that is in, the, in 1968, when the Black Power Movement was flowering. A lot of these investigations became very McCarthy-like in that the FBI was trying to eviscerate the Black Power Movement in Memphis, and in doing so, they not only went after the individual activists, but also tried to undermine associates and sympathizers. And this lady here is a lady named Rosetta Miller. At that time, she was a field representative for the U.S. Civil Rights Commission in Memphis. She now lives in Nashville. She runs the Tennessee Tribune. Um, back then, Ernest and other informants were passing on information that she and a co-worker, Bobby Doctor, that they were too close, too sympathetic to the, to the black power movement. And so uh, basically the FBI tried to get them fired from their jobs. I mean, he, Ernest was passing on rumors about them. There, you see in the reports that you know, there was a, there was, uh, he talks about her personal life and supposedly she ran off with a man for a week. And it says in some of the reports that she's one who will give aid and power to the black power advocates. Um, I interviewed both her and Bobby. They were both called in for hearings. They nearly lost their jobs. It was a very frightening time for them. Um, but you know, it's, it's a way that the FBI did act against individuals. These pictures, I think, are almost kind of eerie, the se sequence of pictures. This was from 1973. And again, Ernest had such great access. He was, he was trusted by so many different people. And you know, the FBI used him to, to monitor and surveil just a wide swath of the movement from the NAACP to Dr. King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference to the Nation of Islam and, and the Black Panthers, who at that time were, you know, Hoover had considered them the greatest threat to in, the internal security of the country. He became very friendly and was essentially a member of the Black Panthers. Um, this was taken from 1973. That's the Black Panther headquarters in Memphis, in South, South Memphis there in 73. If you look at these series of shots, you see the, you know, a big sweep of the front door, the front porch of the house. There's, the, there's a close-up of the porch. It goes around to the back and gets the, you know, into the backyard and gets the rear door. So, you know, so what is this? The FBI wasn't keeping a scrapbook. It was always contingency. And so um, they were looking for how you get in and out of that place. He gave them information about weapons inside the house. I gotta tell you, the Black Panther movement in Memphis was always small, and it was not, it, they didn't have the kind of violence that they did in some cities. This group was trying to bring awareness to sickle cell anemia. They were trying to form a, a breakfast program for poor children. And they were also volunteering in mainstream political campaigns. The, the FBI never got any indication that they were you know, trying to blow up buildings or have shootouts with police, that sort of thing. But yet, yeah, they were under constant watch, and so they, you know, Ernest would pass on information about, they had a couple of handguns in the house and a shotgun, you know, kind of like a typical Southern family. I've talked to some of the activists from that time. Um, there was a police raid that almost happened around this time. Um, it's not clear what instigated it, but there were officers who showed up with rifles. As best anyone can put it, a, probably a few weeks after these pictures were taken, um, it, it was de-escalated when uh, the, <clears throat> the Black Panther Party had good representation in Memphis from some very well-standing civil rights attorneys, and it was de-escalated. So it did not turn into the kind of situation that it did in some places. But there definitely was danger to be an activist in, on many levels. And, uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to Mandy. But just I do want to say this, because I think I neglected to say it, but the FBI worked very closely with the Memphis Police Department. Mm -hmm. And essentially, Bill Lawrence, who ran Ernest Withers, set up, helped set up the MPD's domestic intelligence unit, which was kind of an FBI light. They wanted more agents. The level of paranoia was huge. And they were all collecting files on hundreds of citizens in Memphis. It was an FBI, MPD operation. MPD later got in trouble legally over it. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mandy, and she can tell you that story. 
Good evening. It's such an honor to be here tonight uh, with Mark, a journalist who has conducted such groundbreaking research in the field of government surveillance. It truly is. Um, again, my name is Mandy Strickland Floyd. I'm a staff attorney for the ACLU of Tennessee. Um, I work on all constitutional issues that arise in the state, and part of what I do is help run the litigation that we bring on behalf of our clients. Um, and one of those cases is um, that I've been working on over the past year is the ACLU of Tennessee's lawsuit against the city of Memphis and its police department. The current lawsuit really began 40 years ago in the time that Mark has talked to you about tonight. When it was discovered that the Memphis Police Department um, had a unit dedicated to, the, to collecting political intelligence um, against the citizens of Memphis. So the unit investigated and maintained secret files um, on the citizens who were engaged in non-criminal, constitutionally protected activities that were considered subversive or politically controversial. The unit monitored U.S. mail without a warrant, secretly searched homes, tracked bank telephone and student records, and even reported on private preferences and activities of the people that they were surveilling. So surveillance focused on different groups in Memphis. Um, they especially focused on student groups at Memphis State, such as the Black Student Association and the Presbyterian Student Center, and groups in the wider community, such as the NAACP, the SCLC, and the ACLU. The intelligence unit staff and network of undercover officers and informers continued to expand until 1976 when it reached a budget of $1 million. That is $4.2 million today. And $10,000 of that money was earmarked for paid informants. In August of 1976, Eric Carter, a former Memphis State University student and member of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, discovered that his former roommate had been a member, had been a undercover officer and that the intelligence unit had been monitoring his activities. After he repeatedly requested his file, the documents were incinerated. Shortly afterward, there were reports that the city was planning to destroy all additional evidence. The ACLU of Tennessee requested an order from the federal district court restraining the city from further destruction. The order was granted, but before it could be served, the mayor of Memphis ordered that all the files be destroyed. Ten filing cabinets of material uh, were shoved into plastic bags, taken to the incinerator, doused with fuel, and burned. After two years of litigation arising out of that incident, the city and the ACLU of Tennessee entered into a consent decree that created a framework for protecting the free speech activities of the people of Memphis. In the decree, the city agreed that it would never again collect political intelligence on its citizens, except for in narrow circumstances related to ongoing criminal investigations, that it would never again keep files, disseminate information, or conduct covert or electronic surveillance related to political surveillance. Today, the ACLU of Tennessee is in federal court again, seeking to enforce that 1978 decree. The current law lawsuit uh, was filed in 2017 after it came to light that the city maintained a list of people who were required to have a police escort while visiting City Hall. The list included individuals such as the mother of a teen boy who was killed by Memphis police, representatives from local nonprofit organizations, several people who were associated with Black Lives Matter, and other local political activists and organizers. The lawsuit asserted that many of the people who were on the list participated in protected free speech activities, such as protests and rallies, but had no criminal record or no history of disturbances at City Hall. The list suggested that the city was, again, gathering political intelligence on its residents. Evidence collected during the case has revealed that the Memphis Police Department has engaged in, in extensive surveillance of individuals and organizations again. For example, Memphis Police Department created an undercover Facebook profile 
to friend community members, to gain access to their private messages, and to post as if the account were a member of the activist community. During our discovery, it was the failure of the city to redact certain information that also led us to this account. Um, if we had not discovered uh, the account, we might still not have that information through that redaction. So I thought that was a really interesting parallel. So, so what MPD did and what the evidence showed at, um, at summary judgment at trial was that the Memphis Police Department used this, um, this undercover social media account, essentially, to pose as an activist um, in the Memphis community. And then it used the information that it got from people's posts on their social media accounts, from who they were friends with, from what events they said they were going to, and through um, private messages to the people in the activist community um, to figure out um, what their beliefs were. Um, the, the MPD used that information to prepare what they call joint intelligence briefings. Um, that included that information about the community members and organizations. So the joint intelligence briefings included photographs of community members and summaries of their beliefs, and they really functioned like the files that Mark discussed, um, except they were prepared three times a day, and they were distributed three times a day. And while they were distributed widely within the Memphis Police Department, they were also distributed outside of MPD. Um, they were distributed to the U.S. military, to the Department of Justice, to the Tennessee Department of Homeland Security, to the Shelby County school system, and to private companies like AutoZone, St. Jude, um, and FedEx. And also keep in mind, uh, these joint intelligence briefings didn't just have pictures of community members and their beliefs. They also had, also had information like dates of birth, like social security numbers, and um, screen captures of social media posts. MPD then used the information uh, that they gathered online to go into the real world and sent plainclothes officers to the events they discovered uh, from online monitoring um, to covertly monitor the events that were covered in the GIF. So they would send undercover and plainclothes officers to events uh, to take photographs of those who attended um, the events. This included protests, but it also included private community events like town halls and panel discussions or an event such as the one we're all sitting in uh, today. Um, it also included church services, um, a black-owned food truck festival, and um, I think most egregiously, a tree planting ceremony in memory of a teen boy who's killed by Memphis police. Um, the MPD officers used the network of surveillance um, to determine associations of community members with each other and their membership in various organizations. These associations and memberships were ultimately used to develop the city hall escort list that led to the lawsuit in the first place. Um, at summary judgment, the court ruled that by engaging in surveillance of the protected political activities of activists, the Memphis police had violated the 1978 court order secured by ACLU Tennessee. In August, the case went to trial, so the court could hear more evidence regarding the remaining allegations, and we are currently awaiting uh, that decision. Mark, I know that um, you didn't, uh, you were not able to interview the FBI director who did this, Bill Lawrence, but you talked to, you interviewed his daughters, but, but I know at the end of your book you talk about he really had a vigorous defense for um, why he thought that this was right, and in listening to, you know, the current case going on, I'm sure the Memphis Police Department has their own vigorous defense. Maybe, could you talk, could you speak to that a little bit? They viewed their role as protecting the internal security of the country. In fact, their whole, the whole domestic intelligence field, I mean, it often was, you know, another term that was put to it was internal security. So they were trying to, they were trying to locate and um, root out subversives, um, particularly, you know, through the 50s and early 60s and all the way through. But I mean, at some point, the, the focus of these investigations shifted as you started having, you know, 
the, the unrest of the movement and, and the rioting starting in 1965 in, in Los Angeles and then Newark and Detroit in 67, it, it gave, it, it created, it really amped up these fears that a lot of people in the country had and, 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 and it really gave the government more cover, frankly, because, I mean, you can't deny that there was a potential for violence in, um, in uh, some of the stuff that was going on in that period, but um, it, it created a pretext where, you know, you, you look at a lot of these investigations, and again, that so often they will start with a legitimate reason, like, you know, the investigation of Dr. King is probably one of the most uh, horrific uh, <laughs> examples of, you know, a government investigation where uh, basically they were bugging his hotel rooms and um, trying to destroy him, sent a, a, a letter to uh, him and his wife telling him he should basically commit suicide. Um, the lengths that they went were just extreme. Uh, so they would use these, the, the, you know, the, the pretext to um, do all of these mini investigations that were often so abusive. You know, as I mentioned, you know, Bobby Doctor, uh, Rosetta Miller in Memphis. There were there were lots and lots of these things that went on that that went beyond, you know, what they what the whole purpose of it was to be. But you know, they believed basically. Um, they were treating American citizens as as they would treat a foreign agent who was in this country. Somebody who would they, they, there, there's a term to it. You hear about COINTELPRO, which is a was a uh, label for a, a, a FBI program, and it was shorthand for counterintelligence. Counterintelligence is what you know governments use against the other governments. It's kind of like if you ever read Mad Magazine, Spy versus Spy. You know they're trying to they're trying to blow each other up or undermine them, undercut them, and that's what they were doing. They were treating American citizens as if they were foreign agents. Um, and so it got so abusive. But they basically believed, I mean, Bill Lawrence, I've gone through his personal notes. Um, his daughter shared all that and it was fabulous stuff, you know, to be able to read that. But I mean, they believed that they were protecting this country from, you know, that the country was coming apart. And, and particularly when you had, you know, the, the anti-war movement, the peace demonstrations, um, they, the government felt very threatened by that. They felt very threatened by Dr. King, who, you know, there's this infamous report that was done in that period of time toward the end of Dr. King's life, and he's refer they, they were talking about trying to prevent the rise of a black messiah, someone who, a charismatic individual who can, who can unite the black nationalist movement, and this is their big fear, is, you know, insurrection, you know, Marxist, communist influence, but insurrection, and they could see all the tangible evidence by turning on the TV and seeing riots on campuses and whatnot, and so it was a real time of paranoia, but, but they considered Dr. King a far greater threat than um, you know, some of the more extreme elements that were actually out there. Did Withers that. ever say that he needed the money? He did He never spoke publicly about his involvement with the FBI. Um, there is one oblique reference that he gave in an interview. I mean, I've looked at dozens of interviews that he gave over the years, and I found there's one reference in uh, an essay that was in a picture book that he did. Um, it's a 192-page book, and there are like, th you know, maybe six lines in it talking about, you know, that FBI agents were always looking over his shoulder. He didn't talk about the need for money. He did mention that a more ideological reference that, you know, he didn't agree with a lot of these tactics. He was more of an old school kind of guy um, where they believed in, you know, fight, uh, winning civil rights through the courts, through gradual, pro you know, progressive type tactics versus, you know, what they call direct action, you know, marching in the street, doing sit-ins, the freedom rides, that sort of thing, where you, kind of the, um, um, you know, more aggressive tactics, he didn't really go along with it. And he had, there was just a real oblique reference to that. But, I mean, there's no question, you know, I believe that money was a big motivating factor for him. And, my, and as a matter of fact, the, my original source, the FBI agent who's in my book who told me about him um, said that Ernest, you know, was doing it for the money. And I don't think that that's necessarily a negative thing for him. He had a big family to feed. He was a good family man. He always took care of his family. He had eight kids, and he was always hustling a living any way he could. And so, but yeah, I think money definitely was a motivating factor for him. If the FBI was investigating Dr. King so intently, why were there no agents at the site of the shooting? The FBI had, um, they had been around that around there. I mean, they were they were canvassing the area. I, I do know that. But 
basically the FBI, I mean, it being, you know, them, the FBI being all white, and they were all, I mean, I, nationwide, I think the FBI probably had maybe four or five agents who were black at that time, but in Memphis, they were, it was all white. So they would have stuck out like sore thumbs. So they relied on informants, and they had a number of informants around the scene at that time. They had, um, of course, uh, Ernest Withers was floating in and out of the Lorraine that day, and, you know, the days leading up to it, they had... Um, there was another informant who was uh, in Dr. King's, um, <clears throat> on his staff from Atlanta who had come up briefly. He was another paid informant. Um, there was an undercover police officer who was there. Who, you know, this story is, you know, many people know that. Um, Merle McCullough, uh, who was actually in the parking lot when Dr. King was shot. So there was an intelligence presence there. It just wasn't that the agents themselves were there. Um, of course, now that this all gets into this this murky area, where a lot of people think the FBI killed Dr. King, and they, you know, they, there's been intense government investigations, including a multi-million dollar congressional investigation, and the evidence all points to James Earl Ray. I, I think the FBI, no question, was trying to destroy Dr. King politically, but there's no evidence that they actually killed him. But these things, these trails, always seem to lead back to. The, you know, the assassination, and understandably so, because, you know, they, the underpinning being that they had that long campaign to try to try to destroy Dr. King. I remember when your story broke and it got carried by the wire services, and it was very new, and at that time there was a real division, it seemed, among the people from the civil rights movement about what this meant, what did, what did it did to his reputation or his legacy, and there were some people that seemed to be very disturbed about the betrayal, there were others that seemed to be very understanding that he had eight kids and he was just trying to make a little money on the side. You've probably talked with lots and lots of people now. What do you see now that we have a little distance from the breaking news? To me, I'm a journalist, and so I try to try to look at this, you know, report it as I would a news story, you know, do it objectively, and try to get in his shoes and understand him. And so, you know, I'm the guy who broke the story. I don't think it knocks Ernest Withers off this pedestal. I mean, I think he's a true civil rights hero. I think the value is is you know this hidden history, um, you know, that that the government was trying to keep concealed is exposed and we can see you learn from history right i mean we can see what they did then and we see now it's echoing today similar things that are happening today i mean if you truly value democracy there's no question we need law enforcement to protect us from true criminals but when these investigations bleed over and start taking wide swaths of individuals who are doing nothing other than dissenting or they've got unpopular ideas that's where you get into trouble with all this stuff and they, they shouldn't be doing that so i mean i think the value is exposing this and as far as Ernest Withers goes personally I mean you can depending upon your perspective you can decide for yourself whether he betrayed the movement but there was no monolithic movement he was part of an older conservative group within the African-American community the the NAACP leadership in Memphis was quite conservative they believed that you win your your rights in court not by marching in the street they didn't go along with a lot of that direct action stuff of Dr. King and they they did begrudgingly but you know, with that Dr. King was doing, or a lot of, you know, the Freedom Riders, and they didn't want that kind of unrest in Memphis. And so I think you got to try to understand him in his times. Now, he did portray a lot of personal confidences and personal friendships where people didn't realize. I mean, like this one lady is in my book about, she was, he took her all her wedding photos, you know, and, and he then behind her back is, you know, she was member of the Communist Party, you know, and they basically destroyed her life. But um, there's another guy, Kobe Smith, who was, uh, you know, a black power advocate, and, um, you know, he expressed quite a bit of surprise, you know, because he'd known Ernest all his life as, you know, the family photographer, you know, the guy who took all the baby pictures, and when he was in high school, his senior picture, and the parades, and all that stuff, and he basically said, you know, he betrayed my friendship. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it, but... Um, I personally think that Ernest, because of all the great pictures he took, I mean, remains a true civil rights hero. I recognize the chaos you're describing and how frightening it had to be to the government, but it's not that situation anymore. Can you, can you address the lack of a learning curve in the city of Memphis that they would continue to do this kind of thing, and what motivates this kind of conduct? The majority of the testimony given at trial was from the officers themselves. And what they would tell you is that we are in the same moment today that we were in in the 60s, and that we are in a period of extreme unrest, we're in a period of targeting of law enforcement, and they must do this to protect themselves. From that testimony, what appears is that 
they are drawing parallels and, and they're equating criticism of police brutality with criticism of the police themselves. I also think that a lot of a lot of the the fear that police are feeling were feeling as they um, delved back into some of these same techniques was based after um, after all of the events of Ferguson and a lot of the police officers who testified um, said that that was a turning point for for them and for the police department but I think what um, what you're suggesting about the lack of the learning curve is that criticism of the police does not equal uh, threats of violence to the police. It doesn't, criticizing police, police techniques doesn't mean that you are criticizing police themselves. And there seems to be a lack of awareness there in, in the documents and evidence that we've seen. I'm curious about whether there are other instances in the nation about informants in that kind of media role, because I hadn't heard of it before. And I'm also curious, Mandy, about whether this situation in Memphis is isolated or if you see have seen this kind of behavior from the police department in other markets, other cities. A big shift in policing has to do with change in and technology as well. I think that a lot of uh, police officers and police departments across the nation see the availability of social media as a tool that they can use to help them in their investigations. And certainly, social media is a tool that can be legitimately used. But um, what you see is an inability to understand the boundaries, the constitutional boundaries uh, between this is a tool that I can use properly or improperly. And there's no assessment of that um, appropriateness of the use or the way that technology impact, impacts the um, constitutional rights of the people that are being impacted. As far as the media goes, um, you know, the FBI, I'm, I'm talking about back in that period of time when Ernest Withers was, was operating for the FBI, the FBI had like scores of contacts all across the community. Ernest Withers was among a select group, really only five informants that were actually paid. So, I mean, he received pay, he had a code number, he was directed, and so he was kind of like a different group. But, I mean, they had scores of people that were considered informers at different levels, you know, that weren't paid or controlled. They would just consult with them, trying to figure out what's going on, what they knew, people in academia, people in the ministry, in the movement, and in the media, too. And so there were, there were several people. I mean, I've you know, been able to identify some of them. Um, Longtime uh, press senator reporter that was the old afternoon paper there that's long defunct, uh, Clark Porteous, he seems to have had a long relationship with the FBI. Um, what it is exactly was built around, it's hard to say, but I mean, they would debrief him from time to time. There was another press senator reporter, uh, Kay Pittman Black, um, who was quite well known in her time, but... Um, she, they would use her for counterintelligence, COINTEL, where they were trying to undermine the, the local homegrown black power group, the, black, uh, the, the invaders. Um, now, a lot of it was rather innocent when you consider you know, the, the spectrum of counterintelligence and you know, sending a letter to Dr. King and wanting him to kill himself, that's one thing. The stuff that they were doing with her was, was more, I would say, benign, although it was it, the intent was to undermine the, the, the movement in that they wanted to basically smear this movement as being a criminal movement. And so what they would do is they would, they would share with her public source information, stuff that she could have got on her own, like, wow, look at how many of these guys have been arrested on different offenses, like burglary, and in some cases robbery and whatnot. And so she would write these long stories, you know. And one, one time I think it was called, it was called the Invader Scorecard. You know, and it was like, like 50 different, you know, individuals. Because they were trying to, to erode their credibility. And so they would share this information. And she was part of this counterintelligence program, but she was not an informant, and she certainly wasn't a paid informant, but they had people in the media, you know, some, I mean, there's a handful that really, that I'm aware of, but they're, you know, the, um, the white owner of the black radio station, their WDIA, he was a contact of theirs. Um, but again, I mean, there was a different animal with Ernest, although I'm sure that you know, this is probably not unique nationally. There's probably somebody out there who is doing something very similar. 
And it was interesting, too, that, you know, in that time, too, the one reason why he was so valuable to them is not only could he pass on the, all the oral intelligence because he, you know, was a movement insider and knew everybody, but the photos, I mean, that it's kind of hard to for us to grasp that now because we all have phones, you know, that we carry around with, you know, we can take a picture and video anywhere, but back then hardly anyone had a camera. So that really made them valuable to them. You bring up a really good point, Mark, because I think that the fact that we all um, carry digital devices with us, we're all taking photographs of ourselves, we're taking photographs of our friends, we're on social networks online that tell anybody who wants to look, especially if they're able to friend you and pretend that there's somebody who knows you, they can go into your social media and they can see who you're related to. They can see who you're friends with, what your beliefs are. And so in a way, it's lessened the need for informants, paid informants, because we are being informants on ourselves. And especially if there's an abuse of that system, which we found in our case. Did any lawsuits come out of the Withers information? For example, the um, gentlemen that were drafted at the urging of the FBI? He refused to report for induction. He believed that the Vietnam War was unjust, and particularly when it came to African American soldiers, because I mean the whole idea that why should we go fight in a foreign war when we're not treated as you know full citizens here at home? But uh, um, he uh, appealed. He was he was sentenced for uh, not reporting for induction and was sentenced to five years. But it was overturned on appeal, and the reason it was overturned was because they found out about this FBI report that Bill Lawrence had had given the draft board, and it was stuck in the file. And he, and the report was basically saying this guy's a big troublemaker. You know, he's causing all this trouble here. He's a, a communist, and you you need to get rid of him essentially by drafting him and sending him to Vietnam. But he but. Charles Cabbage never had the opportunity to rebut that because he never knew about it, and so it was overturned. The Sixth Circuit in Cincinnati overturned the conviction. So then, that's the only litigation that I know that came out of that. Uh, I'm pretty uh, subversive and ignorant because I don't have a Facebook post. Um, so I, th I always thought it was very public, and therefore, when does it cross the line from being very public? and usable for anything to where it's suddenly a concern of the ACLU. The desire to draw that line presented itself really clearly um, in the Memphis case because um, not only did the city of Memphis have this undercover Facebook account, but they also had um, what are called social media collators. And basically, it's a computer program that runs on social media accounts and can capture any public data. So any information that you said to public, they can run a search. And so they can search for, and they did, uh, Black Lives Matter. Or for, um, they were focused very, in, uh, very closely in on the young man who was killed by the Memphis police. So they would search for his name. The Memphis case, because there's a consent decree in place, that creates a boundary that is actually stricter than what would be if, say, the same thing happened in Nashville. Um, but in, Memphis, in the Memphis case, they were also going into private uh, social media accounts, setting up undercover accounts and friending people. And because they would friend, say they would friend um, 12 to 15 people in the community, then the next person they friended would say, oh, well, they know all the people that I know, so I must know them too. I must met, have met them at a protest or a town hall. And so then they would let the person in to be in their friend group, and then that was abused. So I think that's a really important question to ask for all of us, and as we go into this new techno technological frontier, about where those boundaries are um, for privacy. But I think the most important thing is that we should decide where those boundaries are rather than having law enforcement decide where those boundaries are um, because it is the people that decides um, what freedoms and rights we have and not the other way around. When the lines are blurred between uh, police and media, uh, I've been taught in journalism school that uh, it's dangerous for media. What are your views with regard to the confusion between uh, legitimate working press and uh, traitors, I guess? Ernest's relationship with the FBI was forged in the 50s, <laughs> in, a, in a more innocent time when there were 
different media people that we know were at least, you know, cooperating with them. I'm not saying that they were paid informants, but like, the first known incident of uh, Ernest ever informing on anyone was James Foreman in 1958 at the Little Rock Field Office. They were investigating him as a communist, and they were, you know, going into his hotel rooms and trying to figure, you know, look, get, looking at his registry and, you know, whatever calls went out and sort of thing. And so they were very focused on him. But Ernest went into the uh, to the field office there with Simeon Booker, who, uh, if, if you know Simeon Booker, he was a very famous, in his day, um, African-American journalist. He worked for Jet Magazine. Uh, he was a giant in the field. And he had, at, at that time, already forged a, a kind of close working relationship with the FBI. Um, <clears throat> there's no evidence that I know of or that's come to light that he was any kind of paid informant. But he was interviewed late in his life um, about it. and. Uh, basically, what he told the Washington Post was that, um, yeah, I had this relationship with the FBI because, you know, he was from the north, he was operating out of Washington, and we'd go down south to write about a lot of these civil rights skirmishes. He said, I wanted to come back alive. And so I wanted this protection. And the FBI had gave him a semblance of protection. A lot of people viewed them as a much safer alternative to the local police down there, which a lot of times was just code for Ku Klux Klan. So, um, so this relationship was forged in a time when it was more innocent. As the, as, the, as the times changed and you got to the mid to late 60s, a lot of black journalists were openly defying overtures by the government to try to use them as informants. As a matter of fact, there was a New York Times reporter, Earl Caldwell, who, who uh, very famously uh, defied the FBI's attempts to try to recruit him as informant and testified before a grand jury about the Black Panthers. And, he, and his basic line in the sand, he's given recent interviews as well, is that I'm a journalist, I'm not an informant. And there were numbers of, of, um, of other journalists, African-American journalists, who, who all, they signed an open letter uh, published in some of the big publications around the country saying, you're not going to use us as informants. The, the mood shifted because I think the, 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 at that point, people realized what was going on. The FBI really wasn't necessarily their friend. They were coming after a lot of them, and they were trying to undermine the movement, and, and that became clear. So the mood changed. But the ethics of it, I think, is a, is a question. It's hard to gauge it because, you know, Ernest, again, I mean, I don't know that we could hold him to the same standard that we would hold modern journalists, but and him being a freelancer and living in the times he did and, you know, having to really deal with a lot of racism and trying to trying to eke out a living, I mean, I, th I think you have to give him more latitude. But, I mean, the whole ethical thing, I think, is a, is a good open question. I was a good friend of <laughs> Mr. Withers, a better friend of his son, little Teddy, who's deceased. The last time I saw Mr. Withers was at the service of a relative, Dr. Benjamin Hooks in Memphis, still smiling. But I was shocked when the commercial appeal called me because I am Rosetta Miller, Perry, that he had written all those things, very shocked. And I don't know how horrible the things are, I don't even want to know, but. Yes, we do in the news department, we want to know. But however, it's so terrible for me because I used to, I retired from the U.S. Commission on Civil, I mean, Equal Employment Opportunity Commissions. I've had several jobs. And I've had some of the same folks who marched with me who lost their jobs, teachers lost their jobs. They could get a job, not even at McDonald's. Some of them had a master's degrees. It was horrible for the people in Memphis, and that could have happened to me. But my boss did not let the FBI talk them into firing me because my boss in Washington had me doing what I was doing. So, but if it was today, it probably would be a different thing. He'd go along with the atmosphere. But every day I think about all of those brothers and sisters who have college degrees and they just ruined their lives, their families. They lost their homes and everything. It was a disgrace. Now, I like Mr. Withers. We were good friends. And I understand you have to do what you have to do to survive. But like I tell all the brothers and the sisters, you don't sell your soul to survive. 
Anyways, I'm delighted about your book. I got a lot of calls from Memphis. And um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.